Okay, so my name is Jess Bradford. I'm from the Future Students team, so I can help you with any admissions-based questions that you might have toward the end of the session. Um, in a moment, I'll hand you over to Kevin, Wen and Joe, who are going to talk to you about what industrial engineering is um, and talk about our Master of Industrial Engineering program. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here today. All right, so just before we begin, um, I'd like to talk about the Eng and IT community. So if you're not part of the engineering and IT community already, uh, this is a club that's been set up by the faculty for, for current undergraduate students who are interested in becoming an engineer or an IT professional. So as a member, you'll receive access to personalized consultations with our team and the latest news about events such as this one. We also run barbecues and social events and there are opportunities to network with industry and other students on the same pathway as you. So if you haven't joined, um, I encourage everyone to do so. It's completely free um, and let your friends know about it too. Anyway, that's enough from me. I'll hand over to Wen, Kevin and Joe now. Thanks, Jess. Um, just a quick intro by myself. Uh, my name is Wen Lee. Um, I'm the uh, senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and also I'm the course coordinator for the Master of Industrial Engineering program. And today you joined me as um, Professor Kevin Otto. Uh, maybe Kevin, you want to say a few words first? Uh, sure. So yeah, I uh, am in the Industrial Engineering program here, of course, and I teach uh, the uh, design and manufacturing practice uh, course, a project course, and I also teach and, and do research in quality and uh, reliability of systems. Thanks, Kevin. And also we have our Enterprise Fellow, uh, Associate Professor Joe Staines, also with us. Joe, do you want to say a few words on this at first? Thank you, Wen. Good afternoon. Um, I have the privilege of being with the University of Melbourne for the last three and a bit years, and mainly to set up this new degree for you. We're enormously proud of um, what we've achieved and um, the industry flavor that we've been able to integrate into this degree. And we look forward to the opportunity to tell you a bit more about it today. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Um, I'm not sure everyone aware of the term industrial engineering. And actually, it's a well-established discipline um, and being taught in many universities. Maybe to, uh, later on, I'll ask Kevin to give you a bit of global perspective, what's going on in the other side of the world. Um, but just putting short, um, industrial engineers is really about make and doing things in a better and more efficient way. Um, think about all the uh, things you're involved in your daily life, you know, it doesn't matter from food, electronic products, the vehicles, your drive, your tra public transportation you use, literally everything involved a bit of manufacturing. Um, and that is one of the core foundation of industrial engineering. So translate from the design into a tangible product or a service. And we try to do it to maximize its efficiencies and effectiveness and to ensure um, we use um, the minimal amount of resources, being incredibly efficient, have minimal amount of waste, and also trying to recycle, reuse a lot of the materials, um, and also meeting the demand. And how do we define um, uh, the customer's needs and translate to the design language communicated with multiple parties involved in the manufacturing or the entire supply chain, and also meeting the regulation obligations also making the company very competitive and survive in the global competitive environment. So it's an enormous challenge based by not just manufacturing. Actually, um, you know, if we look at all the products we provide, it can be a financial product, it can be a um, service product, uh, it can be a healthcare product. So we see industry engineering work, not just in manufacturing sectors, in actually in literally all possible sectors. Um, well, we started the journey, um, as Joe mentioned, um, because this, this is a sort of new 
domain in University of Melbourne. Um, so we, we had a group of industrial advisors come in to advise us, you know, what has the future influence um, would like to have for, for their graduates. And that is where our starting point. Um, I probably won't give too much away before I start all those interactive um, sessions we had, we plan to have, but maybe we can move on to give you a bit of overview of what this course is about um, and the lens and also the format. Um, so just please move to the next slide. Right, so i um, try to give you a bit of overview. Um, this is slightly different from the other um, Master of Engineering, Engineering courses. So this is a two-year um, or 200 point Master of Industrial Engineering programs. Um, so all the subjects are seats at the 900 levels. Um, so we have 15 core subjects and one selective subject. Um, so Kevin is teaching two of those core subjects. Myself also teaching two subject uh, core subjects. Um, if I put into uh, um, a, a brief description about all the subjects we plan to have. So they're basically covered from um, design to manufacturing. So how actually to design the stuff and to how to make a product. So there's a, a few subjects covering manufacturing processes and how can we design for manufacturing. And then we're looking at um, how do we plan um, production line or manufacturing facilities that um, involves a number of Many, uh, subjects including industrial engineering, one of your foundational ones, um, and the operation um, and process and operation management, um, industrial systems, uh, in, uh, systems engineering and simulation. Um, so gradually we move to um, the management side. So how can we manage um, um, company or manufacturing facilities or industrial systems in a most efficient way. So it's going to embrace a number of ma uh, management subjects, engineer, um, economic analysis for engineers, um, supply chain management, and then you have one of the selectives for one particular um, um, management subject. And also you know, from the next stage, what I call is the advanced subjects, so how to make a co company uh, competitive. Then we're looking at um, the one subject called industrial digital transformation. So this is our take on industrial 4.0. I'm sure you all have heard that uh, term um, at some stage. So this is what we're trying to teach from a fundamental manufacturing automation um, and IT infrastructures all the way to um, how can we utilize the advanced technologies and things like um, um, Internet of Things um, and uh, machine learning or AI, this kind of technologies to be benefited or embedded in the manufacturing or industrial systems. And also it's another subject, this great passion of myself uh, about sustainability. So um, I have a subject called sustainability and life cycle engineering, try to um, emphasize a uh, life cycle approach. How can we, from an engineering point of view, design a product that, to face entire life cycle of a product from the raw, uh, raw uh, material extractions usage all the way to its end of life solutions. And in the end, we will have um, the last year, you will be taking a one year capstone project, very similar to the other master of engineering courses. Um, and we would strongly encourage you to take industrial-led um, capstone projects. So you will be working in team of um, three to five, um, and most likely you will be embedded in with one of the companies working on um, um, very real industrial projects. Um, so this is probably um, an overview about our course. Um, so from the knowledge side, you know, we try to cover from the design, make, uh, manage, and compete side, but also we a lot of subjects um, we planned is um, centered about project or try to bring in hands-on experience with you. Uh, later on, Kevin could give you a few examples. You know, 
what are the hands-on projects we will bring to link to this course. Um, and another thing we try to emphasize is all the industrial grinding activities because this is strongly supported by the industries. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities you will be um, provided to interact with the local industries. Um, it is both available for domestic and international students. Um, and we have two intakes, so uh, semester one of February um, or semester two of July intake are both, uh, both works for our degree. And our course will be, um, or we are on track to seek the accreditation from the um, Engineer Australia or EU AC and the Washington Accord. So basically, it means you will be able to practice as a certified or acc accredited industrial engineer in most of the developed countries or, or, or the major economies. Um, so the plan so far is we're seeking the provisional uh, accreditations and we just had the visit last week. Um, what I can tell it's, it's um, going really well, but um, the results hasn't come official yet. Um, and probably in mid of 2023, or by the latest 2024, um, we will have the full accreditation. So everyone coming into the course, they will um, have their accreditation backdated. So you shouldn't be worried about that. Um, I think the last point, internships, and that's some of the questions raised uh, earlier. Um, so we don't have a space for um, the E, um, ENGR 933 uh, internship for credit subjects. However, we do encourage people to take internships. So there's a multiple way of doing that. Um, so we definitely will support you to take internship for uh, non for credit. Um, and there's a, um, plenty of opportunities provided in the universities. Um, and you have our full support to take those internship non for credit. Um, on the other hand, um, as I said earlier, would encourage you to do um, um, industrial-led capstone project. So you basically will be integrated in a team environment working on our industrial project. Um, and a lot of them actually are using those industrial-led industrial capstone projects as a way to test the future uh, employee candidates. Um, I probably will stop there. Um, maybe. Jess, Jessica, we move to the next slide. Right. So um, the entry requirement applications, this is a slightly different, again, from the other disciplines, but very similar. Um, if we break down to those key points, first, you need to have a minimal WAM of 65 um, in your last um, three years in all basically in your Bachelor of Science degrees. Um, and we didn't really specify uh, industrial engineering or any engineering majors you can take. So basically, um, if you have done mechanical system engineers with Bachelor of Science um, or civil engineering, electrical engineering, so all the engineering systems actually would allow you to take our industrial engineering program. Um, the reason why is, if you look at all the products I mentioned earlier, whether it's a food, whether it's um, oil, petrol and oil, um, if I like electronic goods, or if it's a building product, right? Um, you require some of the design knowledge from all these disciplines. But to, to be able to produce those things, you really rely on industrial engineers of um, and knowledge. That's one of the reasons um, we designed this particular pathway to so allow people to have those detailed and um, uh, spe specialized engineer skills and then go into the next stage um, coming to us to, to take industrial engineering. Um, and there are some key dates um, for those application deadlines that I probably want to repeat here. Um, it speaks um, to itself. Um, Jessica, maybe next slides. Right. Um, 
uh, regarding the tuition fees, um, this is consistent across the um, fate or, or the degrees offered in the engineering and IT. Um, so we have two different um, my um, categories. So whether you get the Commonwealth support place or you have the international full fee students. Um, so, um, you know, the dollar figures, it's already indicated there. Um, and as I said, it's, it's equivalent or consistent with uh, across all the um, master or accredited master of engineering degrees offered in our university. And also we do have the loan programs um, um, to uh, provide financial aid for students. Um, so that probably can help you to ease some of your, um, to release some of the financial burdens or concerns you may have. Um, again, this university teams to help you if you have any concerns in that regard. Um, so we have student teams, or you can reach out to Jessica's team and that will help you to, to address those uh, issues. Um, maybe next slide. Right, so this is a quick overview about our course um, before um, we, um, I start my questions. I, I would ask um, whether Bella or John, you, you have any questions you want to ask? Yeah, uh, I have, yeah, I think I have read my question uh, before I book this event. I said, if it's possible to have a master of industrial engineering subject to do this subject as an elective of undergraduate, it's the, uh, of my undergraduate degree. So to, to get your question right, so you want to take industrial engineering as part of your undergraduate? Yeah. As one subject as an elective. Right. Um, I, unfortunately, um, I, I think the answer is no, because our industrial engineering subject is at the 900 level to the postgraduate level. Yeah, but I, I found there are some subjects in the uh, subject handbook, and it says if we get a permission, then we can take it. OK, that's something I. I didn't know. I haven't ever crossed that. Um, um, yeah, so because I'm yeah because I'm majoring in mechanical engineering systems, and I also doing concurrent diploma in computing. And I will do machine learning as my computer or uh, concurrent diploma computing subject. And before doing this subject, I I think it's better to have some knowledge about probability and. The probability quantity, I think there is a subject of industrial engineering called this. Uh, yeah, so I'm considering to, uh, yeah, I'm considering if it is possible to take this subject as my elective for next semester. Okay, um, maybe we can take the, your particular questions offline. Um, and then once we have better understanding your study plans, um, so we can advise, you know, whether you can take that particular subject because there's a prerequisite we had for the subjects, and then that is generally admission to a master programs. Um, um, but if it's just particular as uh, scenarios, then we, we could certainly work on that. So I would um, encourage you to reach out to me or Kevin if there's other probably subjects you're interested. And oh, then yeah. we can. The name of sub, yeah, I, I just sent a subject name into this chart. Right. Uh, I also see in a handbook, it says the admission, admission into engineering master levels or approval of subject coordinator for any student not enrolled in engineering master level program. Right. Yeah, so you have to be in the master's level program of mechanical engineering, and then you can take the class is what I would assume that means. Yeah, but, but you said for student now enrolled in master level program can also take this if we have permission. Okay, so um, Kevin is a subject coordinator. Um, I, I probably would provide Kevin's um, contact um, to you. So then we can arrange uh, uh, different sessions to address um, your need. Okay, thank you. 
Then do I need to send my student email into this draft? Yes, maybe. Just type your student emails in the chat box. Thanks. Any, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, thanks. Um, Bella, do you have um, any questions for us at this stage? Uh, not really. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll be the moderator and start to uh, pop a few questions. And, and John Yu and Bella, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions um, and, you know, in, in, in between. So maybe I'll direct first question to Joe. Um, so what does the, uh, the industry engineers normally do in, in your past organizations? Or what type of, what are the typical projects do they usually work on? Thanks, Wen. Um, so my, most of my work history was with the Boeing company, um, making aircraft components down at uh, Port Melbourne manufacturing facility. So industrial engineers were employed when all the good things were happening. Um, so when we won a new program, so for example, when we won the right to make the trailing edge devices of the 787 here in Melbourne, um, we needed a whole stack of industrial engineers to help us work out how we we're going to lay out the factory. So you have the manufacturing sequence of how you're going to make the part. And because we were using new technology that was still being developed, um, it was being resized, it was being refined. Um, and then at the same time, you're getting, um, you know, exactly what are you going to make? What are you going to buy? So you've got all those decisions happening. And of course, you've got existing work. Um, and, you know, as with most companies, you're trying to conserve cash. So nobody wanted to go and build a new building just to make the 787 parts. So what can you move? How can you consolidate other work statement? How are you going to lay this work statement out? That was all industrial engineers leading that work. So very much on the front end of new projects, new work statement. Um, but then again, once we got up and we were making the parts, in most organisations, then the attention swings to, okay, how to make it more efficient. And that might be reducing cost is probably the way you most typically think of that, but it's not the only way. A company, you know, has made a large capital investment and say we said we can make seven aircrafts worth of components every month with that investment we've made. With learning curve and things like that, you would expect over time that you can do better than the seven. Sometimes it works out you can't even do the seven, but we'll leave that story for another day. Um, so there'll be a lot of um, detailed time studies and capacity studies and looking at overall equipment efficiency, looking at how you could do better and get more production through the assets you've already got. So that's another way of continuous improvement, um, apart from just looking at how you get cost out of the build. So that's the kind of ongoing role for industrial engineers. Um, another thing we had industrial engineers, one of the kind of the higher in level of an industrial engineer, they actually scheduled the whole shop from the customer customer demand when those parts had to be in Seattle to be assembled into the plane for a particular airline, right back to when we needed to buy carbon fiber or resin or fasteners, whatever we had to buy to make those parts and all of the scheduling through the shop. And of course, you've got the lean guys looking over your shoulder going, you're not allowed to buy too much and we haven't got room to stockpile a whole lot of inventory so that becomes a really fine dance and then when a program finishes the industrial engineers are front and center once again on how you effectively close down what capability do you need to retain um, what gets stored 
what gets sold or moved elsewhere. So in a company like Boeing, industrial engineers were very much all the way through um, some very specific roles. But the other thing I'd, I'd comment anybody thinking about in doing industrial engineering, most of my vice presidents and presidents were industrial engineers. They'd risen up through the company. And if I reflect on that and I wonder why, I think it's because it's that big picture thinking. You're really encouraged through this degree to look at the whole system, um, to consider all the inputs and all the outputs and really be watching out for those unintended consequences of decisions that we make in businesses every day. Uh, and to me, that's actually a lot of the appeal of industrial engineering, that looking at the whole thing, not getting pigeonholed. Does that answer the question, Wen? Uh, perfect. Thanks, Joe. Uh, maybe a similar question to Kevin. I know you, you have also um, accumulated a lot of industrial experience. Maybe from your point of view, what does usually an uh, industrial engineer do or professional experience? So uh, in, in my times, I've been uh, working in the United States. I've been working in Europe. I've been working in Singapore. I've been working in Australia. I've been working in China. I've been working uh, all over uh, the globe uh, with, with companies and, and uh, consulting and, and likewise. Um, so one thing I'll say is uh, uh, at the universities I've been at, you know, industrial engineering is just starting here, right? Um, and the universities I've been at in, in Europe and, and so the industrial engineering was uh, uh, the most uh, popular course uh, uh, in the school, all right? The, the good students really wanted to go there. In fact, it was more popular than, than uh, a business school degree. Um, the graduates wanted to, to get into the industrial engineering program. And the reason is, is because the graduates of these go on to create the new business processes, to create and launch, all right, new production facilities. Um, you know, we live in a complicated world these days. Everything's getting more complicated. And, uh, uh, you know, who's in charge uh, of, of designing these, launching these, operating them, all right? It, it's all industrial engineers, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the plane that uh, the 787 uh, that Joe mentioned that, that she, she were, you know, she's talking about uh, uh, the surface, the body surfaces, which are now, they're no longer like they used to be. They're not aluminum, right? They're composites. That's more complicated. You can't just, you know, it's not a homogeneous material that you just roll out. Right? It involves a lot more engineering and um, to make sure that the production facility is, is operating properly. You get the materials in properly, you, you uh, deliver it properly. Um, cars today, you know, it's not just an engine and a transmission and, and you're right. 40% of the value is in electronics. What are they doing, right? Uh, to, uh, you know, to make that work. Uh, the 787 uh, is a more electric air cloth, right? It's, it's a complicated system. All right, it's not just uh, uh, engines pumping hydraulic fluid around. They're replacing all of it with uh, electric actuators. It's got a 1.5 megawatt power plant on the plane. What are they doing all of it, right? It's complicated to keep that working, right? It's complicated to design it. Once you design it, it's complicated to turn it on and uh, uh, commission it and make sure it's working properly. Then when it is operating, you need to make sure that it's uh, uh, optimally functioning in its environment, all right? This holds true for production facilities, for distribution facilities. Now, how do you get a, a, a product from the factory to the customer? It's all changing, right? We order things through Amazon, all right? And re-engineering and making such, uh, you know, redesigning and creating these, that's all industrial engineering, all right? And so there, there has been a big wave toward uh, you know, digitalization and, and making, you know, uh, systems we used to have more efficient. That's, that's going on and still going on and it's still growing. Uh, another thing that's going on right now is what Wen mentioned, which is uh, doing what we used to do, but now doing it with zero carbon generation. Right? That's the challenge of our future, right? Uh, uh, making systems that we have no longer 
need to generate carbon, all right? And I worked with uh, some uh, 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 production factories that are making uh, vehicles uh, in Europe. They're all right now, today, carbon neutral, all right? Uh, uh, they're all electric forklifts, they're all electric robots, they're all electric everything. Uh, delivery by rail, zero carbon generation, all right? That's what we're moving to. We need industrial engineers to get us there, all right? Uh, uh, there's just a lot of engineering work that are going on at, at the systems level um, that we need now. And uh, 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 that's what industrial engineering to me is all about. That's my spiel. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, maybe we, we go back a few years, Joe. I think uh, you joined Shunimo a little bit earlier than me to start the whole journey setting up the course. Uh, maybe tell from your perspective where where we started, um, you know, how it's been, you know, what, what's the journey? Thanks, Wen. Well, I think it started a little bit before both of us, actually. Um, the industry partners had been talking to the university and there was an Australian who was, or who still is, at Cambridge University who used to come back for sabbaticals each year. And he could really see the regeneration of uh, manufacturing and processing industries in the UK and was for forewarning that that was going to happen in Australia as well. And uh, so there's this group of companies had got together around him and were working with the university on uh, what would a modern industrial engineering course look like. And the companies that were involved were um, Asahi Beverages, um, Boeing, Ford, DST, Exxon Mobil, BAE Systems, IBM. Um, they were the starting group and uh, advising the university on what they wanted out of this industrial engineering degree. Well, it actually wasn't even called an industrial engineering degree at that point. They wanted a manufacturing and industrial systems engineering capability. And it was interesting because they talked, when I joined, I went and interviewed each of them, exactly what did they expect from the graduates. And they all talked about teamwork and leadership skills and problem solving and critical thinking and integrity. Um, and very few talked about the specifics of foundational engineering principles. And I quizzed them on that at the end of each interview and um, said, oh, that's okay. You, university knows how to do that bit. What we want is job ready graduates. So that really put the challenge on uh, Wen and myself to work out, well, how do we do that? How do we design a course that does that? And Wen came up with these three pillars, the knowledge, which is your engineering principles and your business management principles, because there is both in this degree. It's not just engineering. Um, then there was the hands-on, the practical work that helps you to grow your teamwork, your communication skills, all those types of things. And then there was the industry grounding. Um, and that we've achieved through, uh, Wen's already mentioned, industry capstone projects, and we've done them with um, Asahi, DST, Boeing, um, Blue Scope, um, and I'm sure I've missed some out, but we've done a lot of those now. I'm getting quite good at them. Um, but also site visits, um, guest lecturers coming in, in from industry, mentorships, those types of things are all part of the industry grounding. And we kept that very strong alignment with our industry advisory group. Um, we meet with them formally three times a year and we have feedback sessions with them in between. And they have a very good knowledge of what this degree involves. And I can also say they're already knocking on my door looking for the graduates. Um, I've got at least three companies who've contacted me in the first few months of this year saying, are there any graduates yet? Where are they? 
we want we we're looking for talent um and, and that reflects my own experience too when i worked for bowie recruiting industrial engineers was really tough because no one's running an industrial engineering course in australia so we were essentially uh, recruiting internationally um, so that is the need that this degree uh, is filling and you know with my experiences from manufacturing but that doesn't mean that it's only manufacturing that needs industrial engineers. It's anyone who makes or does anything because it's all about the process and the inputs to those processes and the outputs and doing that better and better. Oh, good for sense. Thanks, Jo. Um, oh, now we're talking, uh, start to mention about our course. Um, maybe I can ask you, Kevin, if, if there are very important two subjects you are teaching, two core subjects. If we give the audience uh, a little bit of spoiler, uh, what are the highlights of your subjects? What are your classrooms, tutorials or workshops like? Sure. Um, so I teach two courses. Uh, one is the design and manufacturing practice course, which is a, uh, a project course where uh, student teams do a project. The other course is the one we talked about earlier on uh, quality and reliability. Uh, so when you look at some system, you know, a plane, uh, a phone, you know, uh, 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 Amazon service, you know, anything like this, uh, how, what's, uh, what's the quality level? Do people like it? And uh, is it always operating? What's the reliability? You know, and uh, uh, what can you do about it? So those are the courses, uh, the, the subjects that I teach. Um, what I like uh, uh, about them is uh, I make so so the the way uh, that these are taught is uh, as hands-on sort of project-based uh, uh, courses. So the design and manufacturing practice is a project course. It's not a capstone project course, but it is a project course. Um, and so we take a prototype, much as one you might, you know, build in the lab and get working. And now you say, okay, I want, I have one of them. Now I want to make a million of them and sell them. So how do you do that? All right. How do you set up uh, the system to be able to source parts and, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce in volume? So we, we, we in the, in the project, we don't really produce a volume because after all it is a university, but we do redesign the prototype so that the parts can be made using high volume equipment, whether injection molding or CNC machining or um, you know, sheet metal forming. So, so we, we redesign the parts so that they can be produced at volume. And then we make some samples of them. And then uh, we set up uh, a miniature uh, you know, we sort of decide how we want to assemble it. And we set up a little miniature assembly line for uh, to produce uh, around a dozen of them and test it out. So, uh, uh, and so that's what the whole course is about. There, there are, you know, assignments to be done and, and you know, questions posed and things of this nature, but uh, uh, it's, it's sort of experiential. Um, the other course on quality and reliability uh, is more technical, right? Because uh, uh, the, the, the quantifying the reliability of a system means to assess how any and all the parts can fail by what failure modes. And for each of those failure modes coming up with, you know, uh, how long it will happen until that defect occurs, that failure occurs. And so that's all subject to some uncertainty. And so it's all probabilistic. So we, we, we necessarily cover a lot on probability, statistics, and distribution functions and things of this nature. But uh, the basis of all of that technical discussion is on a, uh, a mini demonstrator uh, example. So we'll take a particular uh, mechanical part and we will assess uh, its production for why uh, when I make you know, a, a bunch of them, you know, 10,000 of them, they all aren't identical. They're all slightly different. 
So how different are they and how much uncertainty is, in, is there in being able to produce a part that is in specification, all right? And uh, uh, so there's that. And then what can you do to improve the quality to make sure that more of them are in spec? Um, and uh, another thing is then after the parts go into the field and are assembled into a device and the customer uses it, how long till it fails? What's its life? And that's reliability assessment. And again, the duration until it fails is probabilistic. And so uh, 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 assessing that and improving it is similar to improving its quality. They're, they're actually quite related. So that's what that course is all about. But again, uh, uh, we, we center it around uh, a project, uh, a, uh, a part example. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so a uh, question pop out in the chat from John Lee. Um, do we have any industrial engineering student society in University of Melbourne? It's a very good question. Uh, Joe, do you want to say a few words on that side? I, I would be happy to. Um, so we don't currently have an industrial engineering student society, but we're just setting up um, with the help of an undergraduate student who's similarly doing a diploma in computing science, which is interesting coincidence. Um, we're setting up an alumni um, and that will include people who've done capstone projects with us, as well as our current industrial engineering students. Uh, so that might be a bit of a proxy until we have enough students to set up a society that um, would be a source of information um, for you and you know bits of ambassadors for the course people who are a year or two maybe ahead of you um, I think that would probably work um, we don't have it yet but I'm happy as soon as we decide what we're going to put it on which platform and things like that we'll be more than happy to invite you to join and um, then you'll have access to those those people so I want all of you to come join industrial engineering, all right? Uh, uh, and we, you know, we're, it's still in the sort of inaugural initial group. We have it informal, uh, you know, we haven't formalized it into a whole, you know, uh, uh, a club or anything like that, a society, but it's coming. You know, we will in, in a, you know, in months, not years. Uh, uh, have this and and uh, founding uh, students who have, uh, who are in right now would be happy to talk to you and we can set that up mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know I'll do what it takes so that if you come join this you know you get out what you need what you want uh, you know as as part of your studies all right in industrial engineering all right, I think we're all committed to that we want this to be a success. Um, a few more things to add on this. Um, and nothing I'm going to disagree with what Joe Tavern said. Um, so we currently have a relatively small cohort and what Joe and I have been working on uh, very closely in the last past few years is try to have a very strong cohort experience for you. That's something we'll be very proud of. The way actually we do that is you see we have 15 actually core subjects. So it looks like a very prescriptive study plan. But the good thing about that is, you know, people doing industrial engineering in your years will be staying in the same classroom for two years. So you will be really bonded with each other. Of course, there will be others taking in our industrial engineering subjects. You will be inter inter uh, acted uh, um, with other um, students or with different backgrounds. But, you know, we're going to have a strong cohort experience. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and also we meet our uh, Master of Industrial Engineering students quite regularly, uh, usually uh, informally. We meet them beginning of the semesters and also have a catch-up sessions throughout. One, and also at the end of the semesters, see to check in, you know, how they, they were doing for each semesters. So, um, I agree with Kevin, you know, the society will come in and also we'll reach out to, you know, others, um, cohort, 
or, or future students just just try to make a bigger impact uh, from industry engineering perspective. Yeah, but thanks for the question. That's very relevant. Um, maybe the another question to Joe. Um, you know, all of us are worried about you know this uh, myth or perception about manufacturing is dying in in um, Australia. But what are the industrial engineers' job opportunities there? Uh, or what are the other industries in, in industrial engineering likely to work in? Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, you know, I talked about the opportunities in a very large and mature organisation like, like Boeing, but um, industrial engineers would similarly have extremely good opportunities in startups, um, and there's pretty strong culture of that at Melbourne Uni with lots of support for those entrepreneurial pursuits. Um, so really don't limit yourself to thinking about mature companies. Um, mature, mature companies with US parents know very well what industrial engineers are capable of. So you will see them advertise for industrial engineering positions. Companies like Boeing, like Packard, the people that put the Kenworth trucks together, um, they have a whole in, uh, industrial engineering department. But if you went and looked in SEEK, you would see the types of roles that an industrial engineer would do. Typically in Australia, they might be called business process improvement engineer or continuous improvement engineer, kind of a whole lot of different labels. Um, but they're going to be the roles that the industrial engineers will just eat up because they're going to come into the that marketplace with the engineering discipline but with the business mindset as well and that's what our degree really puts together those um two two things and as you've heard from kevin and you've heard from when you know and i've tried to get across too that's what makes you very employable and it's, it's so versatile because it lets you, uh, you're going to have a skill set and a tool bag that lets you be involved in any industry. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about conventional manufacturing here this afternoon, but there's a huge movement in healthcare um, looking at how they can streamline procedures and processes. Um, and even in Boeing, some of the things we actually took from um, hospitals, like having all the tools ready for a mechanic to do a job, we used to say, treat the mechanic like a surgeon. No one expected the surgeon to go running around and finding their scalpel and their scissors and things. They were all put on a tray next to them. And we used that principle in manufacturing to say, bring all the things that the mechanic needs to put that part together to them. Don't have them running all over the shop looking for it. So you, it's a very versatile, um, very integrated approach. And, you know, a lot of our engineers end up working for financial companies and consulting companies and industrial engineers will do very well in that, that uh, mindset as well. So if you wanted to kind of go check the market need, I'd suggest you look at uh, terms, you know, obviously industrial engineering, but also look at business process, business operations, continuous improvement. Um, more senior roles might be called uh, transformation, transformation managers, um, those types of things. Um, I think that about covers it, When. Oh, thanks, Joe. Um, and also, we not just train qualified engineers, but also future researchers. So maybe the question is direct to Kevin. You know, we both are active researchers. Um, you know, just share with the students what are your key research interests and how actually those can be informed to your teaching or to this degree. Oh, um, well. So my research interests are uh, uh, between design and manufacturing, how to design uh, products and services so that they're 
uh, easily manufactured, uh, you know, and, and can be made uh, with high quality. Um, what I'm spending my time on uh, now lately has been, you know, uh, sensors and computing and machine learning, AI, you know, it's becoming ubiquitous. It's just easily low cost available. Um, you know, generate, so, so I'm, I'm working on uh, developing uh, very low cost, uh, uh, monitoring of production equipment, you know, so we can see uh, temperature, pressure, you know, uh, 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 volts and amps, you know, things of the equipment that are that, uh, the inputs to the process and also uh, uh, monitoring the result. So dimensional uh, conformance uh, of, of parts, um, energy efficiency of uh, assemblies, you know, if it's an electric motor powering something, you know, uh, the KPIs, the, the metrics, the, the, the criteria of, of uh, what's produced and um, monitoring and storing these so that you can begin to more easily on these complex, you know, sort of production systems that are hard to understand more easily, you know, find correlations of why you get um, some run of, of defects uh, occasionally, and which can, which can be hard to diagnose. Um, further, if we put these monitoring as well into the systems while they're in use, uh, so aircraft, you know, vehicles, uh, electric power systems, uh, you know, any, any of these systems, and then you see degradation in performance or you see you know outright uh, failures of, of parts um, if we can uh, uh, correlate that with you know how the part was made maybe some of the parts uh, unknowingly you know turned out to be lemons for some reason uh, uh, or you know but be able to do data mining on reliability and uh, uh, performance in complex systems of this nature so it involves de uh, developing, you know, sensors and measurement that can be deployed, you know, on the cloud, you know, and, and now it's not some big monolithic corporation, you know, like Boeing and Siemens. You know, it's all the little mom and pop operations that we have that need to, uh, that sell to a supply chain that we need to enable, uh, uh, you know, uh, integration. So there's opportunity for that now because you know the whole open source community is making this easy. So uh, uh, that's what I'm spending my time on deploying uh, uh, metrology and you know digitalization into SME sort of supply chains mm -hmm. and uh, being able to do you know uh, really uh, detailed um, quality and reliability uh, uh, analysis for you know. Uh, uh, for a place like Australia that has a lot of uh, smaller operations, let's say. So when, why don't you give um, the audience a little bit of color on some of your research? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my research is predominantly in what we call sustainable manufacturing and a life cycle engineering perspective. So I started with characterizing the energy efficiency of manufacturing processes, trying to maximize the input as well as uh, maximize the output, keep the, the, the high throughput, but also minimize the energy consumed by the process. Surprisingly, 90% of the CO2 emission happened in the factory is is relied, uh, is, is due to the consumption of energy. Uh, so that's where I started my research. Uh, and then it's getting involved. It's not just a machine tool, but it's a whole system problem. You know, how you utilize your resources within the factories, how you coordinate with uh, the entire supply chain and all the way extended to the entire life cycle of that product from, you know, the mining extractions all the way to end of life. And that actually entails the works, you know, people talk about this uh, circular economy, industrial ecology, those, those new terms. Um, so this is actually one of the foundation and of my new subjects, sustainable and life cycle engineering. So you'll be working on a product looking at from 
its uh, life cycle stages from the raw extractions all the way to end of life, what are the input output to go to each individual stages and how do we quantify that? And how can we categorize those input outputs in terms of those environmental impact categories? So people can understand, for example, you have this global warming potentials or people normally communicated as a CO2 equivalent of emissions, right? And there are so many of them. And then how can we, design or using design methods to mitigate or reduce those impact. So this is the whole essence of that particular subject. And you know, it will be embraced with all of the projects I accumulated in the past few years, you know, working um, from different sectors. And one uh, a great initiative John and I both involved is the future battery industrial CRC. So we're really looking at the battery components and which is the fundamental part of the core part for the future electrical vehicles. And how can we ensure we responsibly resource those things and try to minimize the total environmental impact um, of those new future solutions. Um, I'm just cautious about time. We are perfect on time as all industrial engineers do. You know, we, we do fast on time, straight on time. Punctuality is very important for us. Um, but I, I would thank um, Johnny and Bella to join our session and also and Joe, Kevin and Jessica to join our discussions. Yes, I'd just like to finish off and say a big, big thank you to Dr. Kevin Otto, Dr. Wenley and Joe Staines for this wonderful presentation. Um, I found it really informative and hopefully we have a few future industrial engineers in the room um, or, or watching. So uh, if you have any more questions related to admissions or fees, you can book in an appointment with the future students team so we can advise you how to get into the Master of Industrial Engineering based on your current studies. So you can book via that QR code just scan your phone. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that now. Um, otherwise, if there's no further questions, thanks again for joining us today. And I hope you all have a great afternoon. I'll end the session here. Thanks.